I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Max Field, also known as SBN3, Soul Brother Number 3. Max is a director, cinematographer. He's into sound. He has much talent. He's an influential YouTuber. But today, I want to find out from Max, knowing that he wants to direct his own feature film, what is he doing? What is the process to reach that goal, to reach that dream, and what he's actively doing each day to achieve it? Join me today in my conversation with Max Field, SBN3. I'm Brian V, and this is why we work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Max Field, a.k.a. SBN3. Good day, fine, sir. How you doing? <laughs> I, I'm doing I'm doing well, Max. Will you do us a favor? And, and you and I were just speaking, you just mentioned it, but tell us the industry that you're in and what you're up to nowadays. And even though there's a COVID going on, maybe what you would normally be doing if, if this wasn't the case. Generally, what I do is I work in the entertainment industry, sometimes the video production industry. I produce uh, commercials, infomercials, documentaries. I uh, just got uh, my first directed documentary distributed on uh, Amazon Prime uh, earlier this year, or no, last year. Um, but then uh, I, I sort of like half my income is uh, my own self-produced works, which have gotten a fan base of, you know, a few thousand people. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's a sort of, it, it's, it's a lot of everything, but I just say entertainment industry because that's just a nice blanket term. But, uh, you know, I do a bit of the creative end and I also do a lot of the audio video technical end as well, uh, which as I've sort of spoken with more and more people who know that AV technical end, somebody who also writes and directs that, you know, both of those together aren't super common. So I sort of fill the niche where I take care of everything for a company or a client. There's no doubt that you're talented and I'd like to get into that, but can you bring us back, Max, to maybe what would have been your very first job ever as a, as a preteen or teenager? Uh, first job ever. See, that's the thing is that I started, I started super early. I started at 17 years old. And so, you know, I, I didn't really, I didn't grow up in a, a rough enough situation where I had to like get a job as like a 16 mm -hmm. year old. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I immediately went into, uh, I just immediately went into uh, video production and, and just, you know, at first, like, you know, for the first year, kind of not really taking it too seriously, uploading whenever I felt like it, you know, trying to meet people, emailing every now and then. But uh, no, nah, I mean, as far in regards to, to manual labor and stuff like that, uh, because I started so early and, and I tried so hard so early because I didn't want a manual labor job, I've never had one of those manual labor jobs in terms of wages, McDonald's and all that. And within a couple of years by, you know, and, and I was only able to do that because I was a teenager with no responsibilities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I didn't, you know, 18, 19, didn't have school. Or I, I did college for a semester and I dropped out because they weren't teaching me about video production at all. So I had to find that education myself. And so I went after all that. And um, but yeah, by my early, I would say by like maybe 20 or 21. So it, it, it took a couple of years for sure. But by 20 or 21, and also I had the privilege of, of not needing a job as well. And that's something a lot of people don't mention. But by 20 or 21, I was probably making more than a job at McDonald's would have gotten me, which mm -hmm. with a high school degree, that's all you can really get nowadays. So uh, I was like, well, okay, I'm already doing this. I, I didn't want to spend money on all that college because I was seeing how expensive it was, even community college, how expensive it was in comparison to what I was actually learning pertaining to what I wanted to do in life. So, um, so yeah, that's sort of, that's sort of how I started off. And, and YouTube was a huge part of that. You mentioned like, the idea of have, not having to work, having the privilege not to work. But I think there's, you may agree or disagree, but the idea of having children work at 12, whatever, I mean, the legal age, but some people do a lemonade stand or sell cards or do a bunch of things. There, there's also some value in that, regardless of whether you're able to do it or you need to do it or you don't need to do it. Would you agree with that? Like having kids start to work and understand the, the value of a dollar, what it, you know, work ethic and all of that comes with it. So actually, well, then when you put it that way, in that case, I, I guess I was working and doing other things as early mm -hmm. as maybe 14, where mm -hmm. uh, a big way I made money 
still not really working, but a big way I made money was, uh, uh, and this was before video game collecting was huge, you know, after like 2014, it kind of boomed. But uh, in, you know, 09, 2010, I would, uh, I would go up to kids in school and, you know, like the old Nintendo 64s and, and stuff like that. I go up to them and I'd be, you know, and these kids, you know, they want money for pot or whatever. So I go up to them and I'm like, Hey, uh, you got in 64 with all the games. I'll give you 20 bucks for it. And they're, you know, they would like try to like, you know, finesse me. They're like 25. I'm like, okay, 25. And so they show up with a duffel bag and 64, 10 games. I flipped that for a hundred dollars on eBay. And so, and so but that's like, great. Like that's you know, what I this was always, is, right? That's what this is. The idea of yeah. what starts you, what gets you going. And some people think, oh, my, my professional career job. It wasn't until I was 25 that I started. No, what, what was the thing that started you when you were a kid and what really got your, your juices flowing? Yeah. I mean, and so, so it's weird. It, it's the, the concept of, of, I mean, how do I put it? The concept of, like you said, the value of a dollar that was that was instilled uh since maybe 11 because um my dad would always show me he had a a couple of basketball cards and baseball cards and he showed me and they were in the top loader you know the hard plastic uh mm -hmm. and that's another thing i do or like so for instance i got one right here like you see how the card is in the, the yep, hard plastic yep. there and so, inside a sleeve so, in and itself that, too yeah penny sleeve yep and so it, like this is probably like maybe 2004 my dad showing me this uh, and, and he was like, oh yeah, this is worth a lot of money, you know, cause I kept it, you know, and it, it, the reality is that it was, it was a Michael Jordan base set card, not a rookie, not auto, not, not anything. So it was worth like a dollar, but you know, like you, you sort of get tricked into it. And then, you know, as a kid, I guess the first like thing I went into in terms of money and looking up price guides and all that was basketball cards. You get the Beckett basketball magazine, uh, and then like, you know, you get into Yu-Gi-Oh and then all the money flipped there. And so it was a lot of, I mean, I'll be honest, it was a lot of not manual labor. The only time I really got into manual labor was when I realized I needed to light properly to make mm -hmm. good looking images. And then, mm -hmm. so you get into all the heavy equipment, mm -hmm. the 1k mm -hmm. tungsten, the, you know, the stuff that you'd see on like a real cinema set. So it, it's, it's weird. I, I, you know, I sort of was able to get this is why it's strange is like some people would, would look at that as like a very, you know, illustrious privileged lifestyle and all this. And, you know, to an extent, yeah, okay. But I, I had plenty of friends and I knew plenty of people growing up who were 18, 19, no job, not doing anything but playing video games all day. And they had the exact same time frame that I had to do what I set out to do. So, you know, <laughs> it's... Yep. It, it, it could go a million different ways, but uh, no, just the concept of, of not showing up, not, you know, waking up, hitting the alarm clock at eight in the morning and, and, you know, groggling every day to, to work or school or whatever. Like I wanted to avoid that so much. I had crippling insomnia and I missed probably 70 days, one year uh, of high school. And then the, the next year it was like, you know, another 65, 60. And so like, I, I, I saw it. It's not that I thought I was above a regular job, but I thought I couldn't do it. I thought mm -hmm. like I didn't have the body to do it. Cause like what job is going to keep a guy who misses 60 days, they're going to fire your ass, you know? So uh, I had to, I had to make a, a living based around, you know, okay, I'll work a lot. Like I was, I was willing to work a lot, but I couldn't control when I would wake up or go to sleep mm -hmm. because of that insomnia. And I couldn't have access to sleeping pills too young for that. You know, now I can, but uh you know, it's, it's stuff like that, um, where, you know, that's sort of how life works, you know, little quirks in your life sort of put you in the path you're on today. There's a, I was reading something the other day, and it's some sort of path that I, I think I appreciate the idea of just wondering how the school system works, the value in it, and what they've been doing compared to what has been done years ago. And I was reading someone and he just mentioned the the value in playing, which is obvious, but it's not always obvious, say, in a classroom and allowing kids to play and kids get so busy. I live here in South Korea where even my own children tend to fall on more of the work side of things than it is in play because they have school, then they have after school academies, then they have homework. And then it's like, where do we squeeze in playtime? As a kid, is there some sort of thing that you enjoy doing? Was it just video games? Is it like maybe say seven to, to 12 or something. Was there something that you played at a lot that you really enjoyed something that you recall? Seven to 12. I mean, I was super into basketball. Um, 
you know, because because I was one of the taller kids. I'm six mm-hmm. three now, um, and so I went to a lot of camps. Like every summer, I went to a basketball camp for like about a month. Um, and so yeah, so so basketball idolizing, you know, you know Michael Jordan. I'm, I'm from DC, so so the guy in that icon is Gilbert Arenas, and so that was you know. Washington DC hasn't had a sports star like that in, in 15 years. So that's why I haven't changed it. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. cause you know, and, and it, it, what was special about uh, Gilbert Arenas is that he wasn't drafted and forced to play there. He signed to us, you know? So it, it was like that thing of like, wow, somebody actually chose to be in Washington DC. Cause that's where I'm from, I'm from the DC beltway area. Yeah. And so, and so it was, uh, it was one of those things where, I guess that's where you initially learn about uh, work ethic and practice and stuff like that, maybe, uh, where you see, you know, mm-hmm. the stories of Kobe Bryant. Uh, and and I thought the one silver lining of when Kobe Bryant died in the plane, or no, the, the helicopter accident, mm-hmm. was Pete would, you know, the average person outside of a basketball fan would start looking into this guy and how amazing he was and, like, the level of preparation that went into everything he did. And unfortunately, that didn't really happen. Uh, you know, people still, you know, like the average girl or the average guy who likes video games. Oh, he he was a good basketball player whatever. But, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, and that's, and I think that's what separated me amongst other film people and art people and stuff like that is that in the film and in the arts, they don't talk about, you know, working back to back 14 hour nights up till 4 AM. But in sports, they talk about that all the time. Mm -hmm. They talk about, you know, grinding your body through this stuff and, and working when sick and, and, you know, working, you know, regardless of the condition, you know, <laughs> you know, a guy, you know, again, like Kobe Bryant, this is a guy who's, who's having muscle spasms in his back and that would cripple any other person. And he goes out there to play because there's another good player on the other team. And it's like, Oh, it's going to look really bad if I don't, you know, yeah. and, and these guys are partially psychotic. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not like all the screws aren't there, but at the same time, like that's sometimes being crazy is what like enables you to be great. You know, like, and so one of my fascinations moving on, it started with, you know, you know, Kobe and Jordan and guys like that. And then moved on to, to Penn and Teller to, um, oh my God, Mm -hmm. to, uh, to Tiger Woods, to, Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, who was another one? Damn, this is going to kill me. Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, Michael Jackson, you know, uh, and moved on to these guys and you would see a lot of similarities in the preparation they did in the creative divergence they had, um, but yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question or just no, it does. where like you idiot, play. But... No, 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 it's not at all where you played and, and your motivation in basketball and seeing in these individuals, their work ethic, which isn't always at the forefront of people's minds when they think of that particular craft. So when you started to get into right. audio and video, when did you, I, I know you went to college for, took a few credits when you realized that wasn't for you. When did you realize this was for you and that you were getting some traction? Was there, you got a payday one day? Was it, you got a like on a video? How did that transpire for you? So it, it, it's weird. Um, well, okay. So, I mean, I was trying to make, uh, cause I saw YouTube and I saw that other people were making short films and stuff like that. You know, guys like, like make me bad 35, like he's a throwback for anybody who was around back then, but he was like, Oh eight YouTube, you know? And, and that's the kind of, that's the part of YouTube that I really romanticize. Uh, and so I, you would see these guys make little comedy skits. And so when I was like 13, that's when I first got a YouTube summer of 2007, I was, you know, I was trying to make, you know, a bunch of shorts with friends and stuff like that. And so that was like the initial sort of, okay, shooting, editing, you don't care about exposure. You don't care about framing. You don't care about, oh, what's this shot mean? You don't care about, oh, is this script gonna pay off later? You're just literally just trying to be funny with a camera. And so it's, it's kind of, it, you can make stuff very quick like that. And you know, you're able to just get something out on a weekend and it's all good. Um, and then a couple of years later, I kind of, you know, I kind of lost interest in it. I would still play around, but I wasn't really doing it as much as I did when I was in middle school. And then, um, and then one day uh, I was in, I think I was in marketing class uh, senior year. So, so this is what, like maybe three or four years later. And they're like, oh, everybody has to do a movie trailer. And so, uh, you know, like everyone else, you know, marketing is, is like a kind of a big slack off class. Like nobody really cares. And so uh, everyone's like, oh, I don't know. And I, there's something in me. I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll do it. Cause no one else is going to fucking do it. So <laughs> the, uh, so I, I do it, we, we shoot it, I go home, I take and edit it because I had like real editing software because, you know, back in middle school. And so I take it, edit it. Every other kid's thing is trash. 
And I was the only person who actually showed up with like something that really resembled a movie trailer. And so, you know, it, it, you know, like I, I didn't really care about at 17, like I was so disinterested in everything, you know, depression, <laughs> all this. And so uh, I, I, I specifically remember the marketing teacher was like, he's like, do you do videos? Like, is that what you do? Like, is that what you want to do? Like for money? And I, I looked at him and said, I'll do anything for money. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, you know, and so they were like, oh, you shouldn't say that. But so, <laughs> you know, so that, that that's when I saw, what's that? But but you mean they're saying you shouldn't say that, but but seriously, I will <laughs> do whatever. Yeah, for no, but uh, but no. So uh, so you know, I sort of took that, and then uh, it, it it just got to a point where you know it's 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 one of those things where uh, okay, every kid is just sort of brainwashed into thinking, oh, well, you need to go to college, and so I'm 18 now, and I'm like okay, I guess I'll do the, the media degree. Like, like, I don't know, my, you know, my dad didn't really care like what he's just going to college. So, so I do that. And, and that mentality is screwing over so many kids today, at least in America. I don't, I don't know how Korea is, um, but oh, it is. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, but yeah, no, nah, no. Nah, so let's see. Yeah. So I, I'm doing that and uh, that's sort of how it transitioned. Uh, I remember there was a, there was a gap. Um, it was between semesters. It was between the, the winter and spring semester and, or no, it was just after the spring semester and I finished math and I, I got another C I had probably a 2.5 in college after three college credits. And, um, you know, I, and I, I wasn't going to start again until, you know, September or, or whenever the new semester started. So it's 2013. I'm like, okay, I'm going to, really take this YouTube thing seriously. And it was literally like one day I just woke up in bed, like March, 2013. I was like, I was like, dude, if I don't do something, I'm going to turn into like one of these other losers I see on the internet all day. So, you know, so I'm literally producing two shorts a week, every week. It's like a hundred to 110 hours a week, not a single day off, nothing. And I'm just working for purpose. I'm just trying to see if I can get something to happen because you, you, it come, you come to that crossroads where it's like a lot of people go through this thing. I, I think it's interesting. A lot, most people have this thing where they're like, oh, well, uh, me in a year will figure it out. You know, like, oh, me in 10 years will figure it out. Me, you know, and people, they sort of like, you know, stumble through life like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I made the decision at like 18 and a half where I was like, I'm not going to be the guy who just stumbles into it. I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try and so, but yeah, no, I, I probably produce, oh man, I probably produced like 60 videos, like, you know, written, edited, shot, directed videos in, in a year. And, you know, the sub count went from, you know, maybe it wasn't so big at first. It was, it was, you know, the sub count was maybe 2000 subs to, I don't know, like 4,000. Mm -hmm. That's it, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, which, which is big for some, but in terms of making money off YouTube, that's nothing. And so, but I, I guess like that's sort of the thing is like when you're really, really trying at something, you know, you, and, and when I teach workshops on YouTube marketing, what I tell people is it's not like, oh, you do this, this, and that, and it'll happen. You got to consistently produce for two to three years and you are guaranteed to see some sort of movement. You are guaranteed to have routine following and stuff like that. But a lot of people can't get over that hump. And again, the only reason I was able to do that, there's people with jobs, people with responsibilities, people with families. The only re the only reason I could do that, I was a kid with no responsibilities, mm. and and I saw and I saw that I was able to do it. I didn't quit on it. I kept doing it. And then by the time it was time to you know re enroll for some credits in college, I was like, screw that, I'm done. And so and that was probably like you know September October after I had produced maybe thirty videos, and um you know so so that's sort of that's sort of how it goes. But but it's a risk. A massive risk and, and you know for for a good like three years there was such anxiety over like did i make the right decision and after you get over that hump where you start seeing some of the dollars roll in uh, you're like oh thank god i didn't go in debt for that thank god mm -hmm. I, you know college or whatever and then i was also realizing as, as i learned more and more and i started taking workshops or i started teaching workshops um where colleges, how do I put it? Where, where college students, sometimes Yale graduates, Ivy League graduates were showing up to learn about, oh, how to write a joke, how to, you know, shoot, uh, you know, this shot. 
I would go over stuff that are like, my professor didn't talk about this at all. They just talked about missing son and they talked about uh, all, all this shit that nobody cares about uh, if you're actually trying to work on a film set. On a film set, they want people, they want electricians. They want people who can move heavy things. They want the guy who can light. They want the guy who can, you know, uh, you know, accurately focus a lens, you know, using the measurements and all that stuff. That's what they want. They don't want mm -hmm. Mr. Creative. You know, mm -hmm. that's, and, and what, I'm, what I'm alluding to are the blue collar jobs of cinema. Not the writer, not the director, not the producer, the guy moving the light, the guy who knows how to organize all that stuff. That, that's the majority of the jobs people are looking for uh, in cinema. But also, you know, but so I see that these, these kids showing up, they don't know, you know, like I'm teaching all these things the professor didn't teach. Uh, I did a video on ADR and how that goes. Mm -hmm. I'm, getting, I'm getting DM'd. Uh, universities are, Arizona State University, uh, that was one in specific, which is the highest attendance in the entire country. They're playing my video in their media classes. It's a good and video. And so, you know, and that was, thank you. <laughs> so, so 2017, 2018, that's what I realized. Just me doing whatever, like me, like grinding by myself, not, you know, waiting for someone else's curriculum. I, I have, you know, I have surpassed what is required of a degree just on my own. But that happened because of the, of constant insecurity. That happened because, you know, even now, like, like or, or, or you're like, oh, you're an expert. I still, I still don't think I'm an expert because you always have to surround yourself with people way better than you or else you're never going to get better. You know, that's kind of how it goes. Well, I said this to you before we started. You speak so clearly and listening to that the the video that you just mentioned and any of your other ones you on there you sound like a wise old man right <laughs> just bring in <laughs> truth to people that is applicable to this industry right and if people are not in the industry you may not be interested but you may enjoy your movies which you're funny right you're writing this stuff as well Thank you you, you <laughs> like you have this ability to write to speak to present and obviously with your editing and all that goes in behind the scenes, as you, as you mentioned about a basketball player or singers or whatever, there's a lot of work that you put into it. So you are, and, and for you to be, what are you, 26, 20, 26, right? To be 26, like I said to you a while ago, I'm an, I was an idiot. I still am an idiot, but I was an idiot at 26. And for you to be thinking like, I got to put in this time because I don't have this responsibility. I don't have those things to do. And I'm going to do this now while I can, right? Like there is a saying, I think, you know, put in while the, I don't know, the, it's not raining or whatever it is. What, what I say is, what I say is, uh, if you don't do it now, it'll never happen. That's what I say. And that works. I like it. Right? And that's what you're doing. And yeah. so I commend you for what you're doing. And so I heard you say that your, your dream, your goal, you may not have used dream or goal, but your aspiration is to direct your own feature film. Would that be accurate? Uh, to an extent, and I, I do it here and there in little bits, like I'm producing a, a, a video game right now that's the length of two feature films, um, but <laughs> still not, you know, it's not that shooting, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it's not what I want to do, which is, you know, like the classic American film. Like I want to make, you know, I want to make the next, not even like, not even like Citizen Kane, like not, like I'm not really into that stuff. Like I'm into like Josie and the Pussycats that came out in 2001. I love that movie. You know, I, I like not another teen movie. Like I, I liked, I liked all the stuff that was on Comedy Central that everyone said, oh yeah, it sucks. But me and my friends, we watch it. We're like, dude, this is great. You know, like, um, and you know, like, you know, like Kevin Smith movies and Spike Lee mm -hmm. movies, you know, stuff like that. Like that's sort of the stuff I'm into. So um, what does this look like and, for uh, you? Yeah. What does this look like for you to be where you are now and, and to be young, to, you know, you're, you're exercising, you're working out on the side, you're doing all that you need to do to gain that experience, to, to gain the knowledge. You say you're not an expert, but you're, you're striving to be. What does that process look like for you to get to the opportunity to direct your own feature film? And what are you doing to attain that? Uh, talking with an investor in Singapore right now, uh, I might get some good money to do an animated pilot. Um, Doing animations okay. 
because uh, I sure as hell, we, we, there's no way we can get the money together to do a live action pilot because that's just, oh God, it's too much money and too much organizing and hotels and all that. But, uh, you know, it, through doing that work, it, you know, it, it got my talents out there. And so you would meet people who would meet you through the YouTube. One time I did an animated pilot for someone that paid, you know, a couple thousand dollars. They put it up uh, wherever they were trying to shop at the Netflix, um, you know, uh, but the reality is, is that uh, every, everybody needs a big break. Everybody needs a lucky break. You know, that that's just kind of how it goes. And um I, I, you're, you're waiting for that one right connection. You know, you have a network of people. If one of them gets a TV deal, I know that they're going to call me to do audio. I know that they're going to call mm -hmm. me to write jokes. They might call me to act, you know? And so that's a big thing, like creating this, this tightly woven web of people, um, you know, to, to see, you know, okay, if one of us take off, we're all going to take off. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's sort of, but, but yeah, I mean, the reality is, is that, unless unless someone comes through and and you know gives a blank check or someone comes through and says hey i spotted this and i want to put you on unless somebody says that i i am never going to be the star people think this work ethic would lead to um and that's that's the unfortunate reality um and so like i'm first generation entertainment i don't i didn't have a single connection in any of this when i started mm -hmm. and so uh you know so that's that's kind of the thing. I, I, nepotism has only worked for me one time, uh, and that was doing an infomercial where I was underpaid uh, to go all the way up to New Hampshire to uh, you know do an infomercial for uh, uh, an uncle's uh, geology company. And, and, but that's you know that that's that, that's pretty much the only time nepotism has really worked for me. And so, uh, you know, you, you kind of develop a thing against second generation entertainment people. You know, you see people talk about how talented Billie Eilish is or whoever. And I'm like, dude, like her, her, her whole family is in the music industry. I could have easily done that. <laughs> you know, I, dude, if, you know, if, if my dad was Howard Stern, I would have been the next Howard Stern, you know, like that's just, that's just kind of how it goes. Um, and so, but no, but you really respect the, the first generation entertainment people. You really respect a Kevin Smith who maxed out three credit cards to get 27,000 to produce his first feature. You know, I'm that game I mentioned earlier, I'm probably, you know, 10, 12,000 in the hole for that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to make it happen, but, uh, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be smart with money. You know, you can't, you can't waste it on, you know, a new car. You can't waste it on, you know, anything. There was a while. I mean, I buy a lot of memorabilia and stuff like that, as you might've seen in some of the videos. Um, but there was, there was a three year stretch where I, barely spent any money i didn't buy new clothes mm -hmm. i didn't buy anything for leisure at all uh and and i didn't i didn't start you know spending anything until i was making you know you know not well into the five figures let's say and so um you know but but that's just but that's the unfortunate thing that that everybody has to know going into it is that you you know your talent might lead to a connection but you got to understand you're not going to pop off like like a superstar you're not going to pop off until the machine is behind you yeah and a lot of your videos you have things that have personal meaning to you that other people would not really understand unless they knew you better i see you have kfc chicken in there a lot is is this a personal KFC, fave uh, is i saw it with your your fred and bernie the bucket oh no, nah, I mean that was just a thing. I mean, I I I prefer Popeyes more. Uh, I, I heard Popeyes. <laughs> I love Popeyes. Have you ever tried Korean chicken? Oh. Do you have no. that? Not in your area. <laughs> Never will. I'm if sorry. You... Oh no no no! Korean fried chicken chicken is delicious. Just so you know, they they do a I hot am... sauce. I... Oh, it's delicious. I am a very lower middle class American raised sort of kid. Uh, my palate is very American. Uh, the only East Asian food I can eat is Sarku Japan in the food court. That's all I can do. I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> Korean chicken. <laughs> Korean chicken. They they kind of stole the idea from North America. So it's not it's not like Asian chicken. It's like spicy, crispy, and I think it gives a good run for the money to any other chicken place. In my personal opinion, do you have a script that you? <laughs> If someone offers you one day, maybe, maybe give it a try. It's it's delicious. Believe me, I 
I've lived in Korea for 11 years. <laughs> they have some pretty delicious food, um, but also some food that I stay away very far away from. But the chicken is just, it's yeah. a fried, fried chicken, which and it comes spicy or soy sauce. Uh, do you have a script that, you're, that you have prepared and ready for an opportunity for a feature film? Uh, for a pilot, yes. For a feature film, no. Uh, one of the, the the dub feature thing that I made, Taste Closed, uh, so it's an hour long. One of the one of the things I did when writing that was I avoided because it was footage used from something else. But what I avoided, I avoided any character referring to each other by name, and so I have all the audio and all the writing done for a project. And so if somebody came along. I could technically produce that the right way. I could produce that the right way and have, uh, you know, completely free of copyright. You know, somebody says, oh, I'll put up, uh, you know, 250,000 to get this animated. That's technically my first feature. Um, you know, not, you know, legit. Like I can, I can sell that to somebody. I can distribute on Netflix. Um, I have to pay for about 10 songs to be <laughs> licensed to with that audio. But, uh, you know, uh, but then I have a pilot script that's a that's a 22 minute thing, sort of like a Gen Z Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I got that registered by a WGA for 25 bucks. So, I mean, yeah, so no one's let's hope nobody steals that when I pitch it around. But yeah, no, it, it's unfortunate. Like the only way people will listen to a pitch meeting is if they're a fan of you or, you know, you have a rich uncle, you know. Uh, but yeah. Speaking of work ethic. I think maybe you can talk about maybe your methodology, the reason why you're doing it. But I heard you're not, you have a good following for your YouTube channel, but you're not making a significant amount of money in your words, but you mentioned a moment ago, half or something, but you're making some money there, but that's not the sole purpose of why you're doing it. But you're, you put so much time into that. So what is your reasoning for that? So uh, that interview was a bit dated. It, it was pre-COVID and pre-release of the thing. Uh, the, so what happened was, is so that, that Taste Closed feature, that hour-long feature, it gets taken down for copyright on YouTube. So uh, it had to be put up on, uh, on a Patreon. And, I, uh, and at first, like a bunch of people came on, and now the Patreon numbers probably triple overnight. And so we get that and then, you know, from, from, you know, small amount, uh, you know, but it triples overnight and now it's, now it's actually like, you know, making a good chunk of money. It was the highest numbers I had in the history of the Patreon. Then, so a couple months goes by and then I was like, what if I made a trailer for this? You know, cause it's a feature, you know, uh, cause for the longest time I was so against making a trailer for, for something for like a short, because it's, it's corny. It's like, just watch the short. It's, you know, it's only, you know, it's only eight times longer than the trailer, but now I had an hour long thing. So I was like, okay, let's make a trailer for it. And I put that trailer out and what went from tripling. So it was tripled, then it tripled again. And now it's making like some, you know, passable money. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's why I said half now is because now it's changed the mm -hmm. VHS tapes. Uh, cause, cause we had two features where we produced physical VHS tapes. Uh, and, uh, initially people would get those for 30 bucks, uh, can you explain, for 30 bucks when they would back. Can you explain your reasoning for the VHS tapes as well? Bootleg culture, VHS tapes, you know, it, it's initially we did the VHS tape because, uh, we, we first did Pokemon, mm -hmm. uh, one of those movies and Initially, uh, we would we would take scenes of Pokemon, we put in modern hip hop and modern R and B, and we had we knew a guy who could uh, who could convert things to VHS, get them recorded on VHS, put it in a tape player, and bring it back with all the coloration. And I first did it with the credit sequence of the first Pokemon movie. We were like, "This is a vibe." We were like, "Oh my god, this is cool." Then I'm talking to a couple people, and they're like, "We should get some money together and do the whole thing." And so, so we did that. We got, I, I mean, we only got like a thousand bucks together just to produce, not, you know, not profit. Uh, but we said as an incentive, oh, if you give this much, you'll get a VHS tape mailed to you when it's out. And so we produced VHS tape to the whole cover. And then we also did that, you know, to keep in tradition, we did that with uh, the other one, Taste Clothes, which came out three years later. And so now on the secondhand market, uh, because Taste Clothes got so big, people initially got those for 30 uh, I was seeing people sell them 
for 120, 150, 200. And so it became, it became this thing where it was, uh, for the longest time, I was so into collectibles. I was into, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh and Christina Aguilera and Michael Jordan and all this stuff and, and all this, oh, keep the condition good. And, and now I'm making the things where people are like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I got to drop 200 on that. It's an investment, you know? And so, so that was really interesting. People, people wanted me to sign it. And it was a thing where it was like, it was a thing where it was like, uh, how do I put it? I, I never practiced my signature as a kid. You know, I, I knew all these kids in school who would practice their signature. And I'm like, you are a pretentious asshole. What are you doing? <laughs> Nobody wants that. And so I never did it. But now, uh, like my signature looks hideous mm -hmm. when I do it. So now like I, I have to start thinking about that. And so it's it's weird how stuff like that comes full circle. But yeah, I had to sign a couple. The signed ones are, are worth more obviously than the just regular ones. But now, like I had a couple of friends and they're like, damn, this, you know, I, I paid 30, it was a hundred dollars. This is, this is the best return I ever got on backing a project, you know? So, um, but yeah, uh, I don't well, know. That's that what I liked. The question. Well, I no, that's what I liked about what you said and what was true for you is from YouTube itself, you weren't making as much money as you were with your say blue collar job or working in the lights and, and editing and all the other work that you were doing, which but you were still putting in the effort, which I, I thought that was analogous uh, to people who want to follow a dream, want to follow something, they want to do something, and they might have to put in that time and not get see that return right away. And for you, it seemed like you were getting your name out there. There was a, there was a purpose behind it. It wasn't, I'm not going to make money and I'm happy with that, but you were getting your, your product out there. But at the same time, you were getting exposure. And I just, the idea of people putting in that effort, even though they may not see the fruits of their labor right away. Yeah, that's a hump. A lot of people can't get over creatively and it, it, it's kind of sad. Uh, you know, it, it's, you know, you have to work a lot of people, you got to work for free and cheap sometimes, you know, especially for your own stuff. And, and, you know, people, I see so many people just talk themselves out of it constantly. And it's just like, okay, well, I guess you don't want to do it then. Like, you know, it's not like, Oh, we lost a great talent. It's like, no, like you got to have, if you're going to be a great talent, you got to have that mentality of like, I'm going to work, you know, I'm going to work for it. It was a business day one for me. A lot of people stumble into it. A lot of people just make something randomly. Oh, it's a viral thing. You know, I had made so many hours of content before stuff I was doing was getting clipped out, going viral, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. It was, it was a multi-year process. And, uh, you know, uh, the 76ers had a trust the process where they're tanking and everything's going horribly and they're not winning, but they're trying to get those draft picks. And now they're like a really good team because they trusted the process. Same thing with this. You got to trust the process. You have to, you have to be, you know, working like it's the most important thing in the world. If you want it to be the most important thing in the world, regardless of who's watching, regardless of who's seeing it. And so uh, that, that's the thing a lot of people don't see. Um, you know, e even people with production budgets, you run into some lucky stuff. Like I'll explain to other people who are trying to do music stuff or whatever. I'm like, you got to upload three mixtapes a year, dude. Three which is, you know, about maybe 40 songs, even that, you know, I, I saw there was a, there was a, there was a hip hop artist, uh, named XV and, uh, he, he was really big in the, the, you know, the late 2000s, early 2010s. He had a project called 40 days, 40 nights, where he uploaded two songs a day, every day for 40 days. And so I saw that at like 18, I'm like, well, damn, I got to try to do something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's stuff like that. And, uh, but yeah. What, what is your, your hand in music? I, I went on sound, uh, SoundCloud and um, some of that music is great. I mean, all that I heard was great. What, what is your hand in that? Are you writing, you're producing? Uh, well, I mean, sometimes, you, you know, hip hop, you're gonna take some beats a couple of times. Some stuff I produce myself uh, in terms of just the instrumental. Some stuff, uh, a friend will show up. A lot of it is pretty much sampling. Uh, it, it, it depends on the track. But, uh, but as far as recording and writing and mixing, doing the final mix and master, that's all me. You're multi-talented. Do you have any advice for people thinking of you <laughs> buying games for, from kids for 20, 25 bucks when you're in middle school uh, or even changing your job, right? When you got a little older, you're, you're changing positions, doing different jobs. Do you have any advice for people who are getting into work? 
one way or another, their first job or their second job? No. <laughs> I mean, That's I mean, uh, what, uh, sorry. I, I mean, no, maybe good. reword it. Sorry. I'm a, I'm a little... No, it's okay. it's good. No, I don't have any yeah. advice. Go go get a job if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, I mean, you know, there are a lot of people. Again, I I need to reiterate this. It it's not. I didn't waste my privilege. That that's the way I look at it. It's not like I came from absolutely nothing and oh, I pulled myself up by bootstraps. Like I can't. That's that's not honest. Like I can't project this reality that like oh, I was working two jobs and I did YouTube on the side, but, you know, I was awake, you know, tw you know uh, 20 hours a day. I can't, I don't want to sell anyone that fantasy. You know, there, there are people where, you know, you know, they're, they're I don't know, they're, they're in a poverty situation and they have to work two jobs since they're 16. They have to drop out of high school. If someone's in that situation, they probably can't do what I did, you know? And so uh, that's what I, but at the same time, like I know so many rich kids who, you know, just screw around all the time, you know, and then they hit you up like, you know, 10 years later after high school, oh, bro, how'd you do that? You know, and, and, and it's like, it's like, dude, you wasted your privilege. Your parents had more money than mine, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's kind of the thing. Like, like I, I saw and recognized the, the, the opportunity and the privilege at a very young age. I recognized a lot of things at a very young age. When I was, uh, mm -hmm. when I was 14 or 15, I realized I'm never going to see any of these kids in high school again. I will, after graduation, I will never see these kids. So all I did was screw with people for the last three <laughs> years of high school because I knew it wouldn't matter. That's None funny. of it would matter. Not, it, still has, it still hasn't come back to me. And so <laughs> I, 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 was, I was always sort of, uh, you know, like it, it, it's whatever. Like you got you to gotta see stuff before everybody else does. Same with the video game stuff. You know, I was doing that in 2010, collecting video games and flipping them, you know, N64 stuff that didn't become a concept until, you know, like a widespread concept until maybe 2013, 14, once remember the nineties and all that stuff started happening. You mentioned that you're not an expert, but what is a skill that you are working on to help you become the director that you hope to be? And also what sort of skill is absolutely necessary in the entertainment industry that you've seen so far? There's a lot of skills necessary. Um, I, to 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 rail off a couple, um, communication is key. Uh, adaptability and just like the, the work ethic to block out pain and block out annoyance and block out this and that. Uh, persistence. Uh, one thing I heard was emotional. Oh, self empathy. That was another thing I heard in terms of even if something isn't so good. You can't beat yourself. You have to have short-term memory loss of all mm -hmm. the bad stuff and you got to keep going. Um, and then, but the thing is what's unique about me is there are a lot of guys who are, you know, writer, director, people. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to find a writer, director guy who knows more about the technical end of cinema than me. And that's sort of, that's where I was able to separate myself and really, you know, and, and be able to make, you know, high quality content and be able to teach others is because I just wanted to learn all of filmmaking. Like, so you want to be a director, you know, it's not just, oh, I'm going to learn how to, you know, write and direct and like think up scenes and all that. I learned every part of the process. So another part is like never thinking you're above learning something, never thinking, you know, so I wanted to learn how do they do audio? I, I wanted to learn, um, what kind of lights are they using? Not even how do I light something? What kind of lights are they using? That was impossible to figure out, you know, five years ago because there wasn't like a million YouTube videos on it. You know, how do, uh, or not five years ago, I'd say more like seven years ago. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, there, there was a million, uh, I was trying to figure out what light stands do they use? What's the real stuff? How do we get overhead lights? What's a speed rail? What's, um, you know, oh, you know, what are sandbags for? Uh, Apple box, how do we get, you know, a camera angle low? How do, how do they get the camera to move so smoothly? How do they, uh, you know, like, oh, how do they make that, that light? Right here, someone might ask, how does he get the light to look like that? You know, like just, just all this stuff. And, a lot of it is uh, it's kind of like mock apprenticeship where um, I got to a, knowing how to find the information yourself. I'd say that's another big skill. Um, but in terms of what I'm trying to figure out, uh, 
I don't know. <laughs> like it's it, it's it's been such a grind and you start, you know, a lot so many people tell you you're ready, you're ready over and over and over again to the point where it's like, you know, I know there's still a lot I don't know, but it's it's trying to get up to that level. In 2016, all I knew how to do was maybe shoot with a DSLR, use a couple of LED lights kind of, you know, kind of okay, kind of lame, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't so great. I didn't really know a lot about coloring and stuff like that. And I, I hit a wall where I would try to hit up people who were in film school. Hey, do you know this? They didn't know it. Uh, you know, what cameras are they using? You know, what, what is, what is Hollywood, all this stuff. And then I joined a, a cinematography forum that had people who made movies I had actually heard of. Think about that. Think of how many people say they're in film. Oh, what, the only thing I don't know. You know, so, but I was encountering people who made mm -hmm. movies that I had heard of that had A-list talent, you know? And so I, I had this new knowledge or resource or this new resource of knowledge. And the big thing that prevented a lot of people from also pursuing that in my age group, nobody wants to use a forum anymore. A forum is old school, forum mm -hmm. is lame. I wanna watch a YouTube video. A lot of the guys busy and working don't have time to make YouTube videos. You gotta go where it's convenient for them to express their thoughts and ideologies and stuff like that. And then from 2016 to 2018, that was a boom of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That That's where like I, I, I learned more in that phase than any other part, point of time. And uh, you know, you I, I, I would call up guys, I wanted to learn about the Sony Cine Alta cameras, which were the cameras they shot Spy Kids and Star Wars episode two and episode three and, uh, and some other early 2000s films. And there was a guy in Latvia and I, I was like, hey, you know, you want to, can you get on Skype and, and explain this to me? And he's like, oh, okay. And so, you know, you talk to this guy and you really try to focus and, and he, you know, he has like maybe a thick accent, but he's really taking the time. So you're really trying to learn. And that's kind of the problem is like a lot of people, a lot of people say they want it. A lot of people say they want to do X, Y, and Z, but your knowledge really shows how much you actually want it to me. Uh, and so it's, you know, and people are like, oh, why are you so mean? People are starting out, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm seeing people who are doing this longer than I have that don't know X, Y, and Z. So don't don't tell me I'm being mean, you know, like it's it's just one of those things. Is that, and I'm not saying you seem like this is for you, but patience, is it patience for you something that you need to work on because you're young and people are, even though people are telling you you're ready, but you're not given that chance yet? Is, is patience one of those things that are, kind of gnawing at you maybe I'm, I'm trying to i guess the big thing i'm trying to do is i'm trying to not i don't want to turn 30 without a single big credit to my name i don't want to do that and so not only was success big i wanted success young and i still want success young mm -hmm. i want to be a young successful guy i want to stand out in that way and uh because because i thought about um I don't know, like, like I would think about like LeBron James and how he came out of he came out of uh, uh, to the NBA in high school and he's 18 years old and he's like getting triple doubles and all this wild stuff and and he's like immediately the biggest star ever. I saw that at 10 and I was like, wow, you know, I want to try to do something like that. And so, but what I'm learning now is that you can't be a 20 year old entertainer without a rich family member, without someone in the industry already, you know. Kind of moving you along, unless it's you know maybe uh, unless it's maybe hip hop or something like that, uh, where you know there's always people scouting and so on and so forth. But uh, even then, there's a lot of nepotism in hip hop. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you mentioned by thirty, you know, having your your name somewhere on on a feature of some sort. What is your overarching goal? What would you like? Would you like an Academy Award? Would you what What are you hoping for? I mean, it, the funny thing is, and I heard this said of you, is that you're, I, I found it very difficult to find a picture of you, let alone <laughs> to, to see you on video, right? So it doesn't seem like you're looking for the spotlight, but you also want the recognition like anyone else for the, for the hard work they put in. So to say, you know, I want an award, I want to be up there. And say, I don't think that's really your cup of tea. I think you're you're wanting to do the work and, and for people to appreciate what you do. So do you have a, an overarching goal? It might be a feature film, but it might be 10 of them. It might be a whole series of things. It's, you know, it, at first it was filmmaking. That's what I knew I had a skill in. And, you know, I didn't do what I loved. I did what I was good at, uh, you know, going all the way back to that marketing class. 
And, um, you know, I don't really put my face out there. Well, one, because uh, no one else knows how to work the camera. <laughs> so I'm, I'm always behind it. So, you know, you can't really, and, and I'm a perfectionist. I always have to be in the viewfinder. I need to know what's happening at all times. You know, like I'll make videos where I'm on camera for my friends and the framing's kind of bad, but you know, that's not going out public. So it's fine. Um, but in terms of, uh, I mean, it's it's not that I'm like worried about show. You're the first person ever asked to show on camera. You're you're the first person to ask, honestly. So, so <laughs> that's why I showed up. Sorry you about know? that. And, and so like, <laughs> not nah, it's okay. Blur my face out. Anyway, so so there's that. Um, but what I would say is, let's see, the overarching goal. I mean, like, I don't. I, this is sort of another part of the reason I don't put my face on camera and I don't take selfies and all that. Like I have a very low sense of vanity. Like, I don't think I'm this like attractive guy. I think that people should only, you know, not to put a slight on anybody, but like, I only think people like, you gotta be really photogenic to always put yourself on camera. That's just me. I'm not trying to project that onto anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, so, so, so you work, you, you know, you work, like you work with a couple models and uh, it's like, yeah, well, that's your job. You're supposed to be on camera. I'm not supposed to be on camera. You know, it's like that separation. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of an overarching goal, I mean, like, I don't want to get recognized in the street for some YouTube videos. That's just not, you know, that's, that's not, it's lame. It's like, oh, hey, you did this niche thing and everyone's around, like, what the hell is he talking about? You know, like, like if I'm going to be, if I'm gonna, if people are gonna come up to me. I want it to be for something that's like actually, oh, Netflix, oh, Fox, oh, ABC, you know, something for real, not like, you know, a dinky YouTube video with like 100,000 hits, you know, th that's, that's whatever to me. Um, and so, but the overarching goal is pretty much what I'm doing right now, uh, but with, with more money to play with uh, and, mo and more connections and, and more, I guess, more recognition. Um, you know, I, I, as time goes on, I realize how rare it is to be a multimedia artist and actually get money doing it. Uh, you know, you know, not a YouTuber, not, oh, hey, uh, I'm going to vlog today. Hey, I'm going to stream today. You know, like legitimately like doing a craft and having a bunch of people on it and doing a multifaceted craft, not a one trick pony. I'm, I, the more I see it, the more I realize how hard that is. Um, you know, and it, it's always just come naturally to me. I, I've always wanted to do everything, but the reason why I put so much stuff out there, I don't know what's going to pop off. And so it's just, yeah, I think about Howard Stern, Howard Stern, uh, everything that's, he was the king of all media, right? Like that was, that was his tagline and it, he made a movie. It did well. He did a book. It was the best pre-ordered book in history. Obviously his radio show, he did a TV show that everybody liked you know, king of all media. And so like, like I, I see that it's like, well, let's try to be the king of new media. Let's mm -hmm. try to be great on YouTube, be great in video games, be great in, you know, podcasting, be great in, in Twitter and all this stuff. And so that's sort of what I, um, how do I put it? That That's sort of what I, uh, I look at there. Um, but yeah. What you're striving for. But I mean, it's, it's admirable. I mean, it's not, you don't want to be a, a one shot sensation you want to be recognized and it's not for something frivolous. It's for the hard work that you're obviously doing and, and what you will do in the future. Max, is there anything people may not understand about you um, or, or the entertainment industry in particular that if they understood this, they would have a better appreciation of you and the work that you do in entertainment? I would say, and it's not, and I like how you worded that because I would say whether it's me, you know, sometimes people don't like, you know, the way that I go about things or the way that I talk, uh, whether it's me or whether it's Kanye West, whether it's Howard Stern, whether it's like any, whether it's Michael Jackson, whether it's any big entertainer, like you got to understand that the guy who can go up on stage and have every, have all the eyes on them and be able to constantly produce and stay in their mindset and stay in their workflow and, and be able to handle that. You have to be different. You, you, can't, you can't be like everybody else. You cannot be like everybody. Michael Jackson definitely was <laughs> like everybody else. You know, you cannot be like everyone else. And, and that's, you know, and, and some people appreciate that, but, but most people do not. Most people don't, you know, like, that's that's what sort of annoys me and, and sort of I, I get into little uh people say I'm very competitive 
for for a no good reason with certain things but they're like you know you know i'll say like like dude i work in entertainment like i'm, I'm kind of like this and some people roll their eyes like oh yeah and it's like i mean you could do that if i only had like two viewers a video and nobody cared who the hell i was like a lot of people care who i am you know and you know it wasn't like that when i first started and a lot of people can't see the light at the end of the tunnel and so it's just one of those things um you got to accept that entertainers are going to be different and entertainers are, I should say successful entertainers, maybe somebody who's seen some success, seen some money, some recognition, but entertainers got to be, uh, you know, you got to understand that they're wired differently. And um, oh, there was another thing with that. Damn. Hold on. Sorry. Having a bad day. <laughs> no, no. Well, I'm <laughs> dragging you on too. No, it's, it's as you think about it, just, it's right, right? Like even an athlete has to be different. Like people that are doing these particular industries, no matter what job it is, right? If you're talking about the garbage man, if you're talking about the president of the United States, these people are doing these jobs are different than most other people because most other people aren't doing those particular jobs and is no different than it is for the entertainment industry. Uh, it might be a little different from, well, from this it, it's, stance. It's different. I mean, like, makeup of who that person is and what they're doing but the individual skills and talents uh, the personality whatever goes in only certain not everyone can do this job or that job it doesn't matter what job it is is there's different skill sets that don't match other people's and for other people to understand it you would have to have an appreciation that they are suited for that particular job the more you refine it and define it it's there's there's sharp contrast in with these different industries but not everyone can do these jobs and for what you're doing not everyone can do what you can do and to right. appreciate what you do is is what you're asking because you're there to entertain too right you look at athletes as well it's you're there to entertain it's like comedy i've, I've gained a, a great appreciation of comedy because comedians are going up there to make you laugh so try not to be the fool in the right. back who, who's criticizing the guy who's up there. He's laying everything out, a girl laying everything out there to entertain you and putting hours and hours and years, decades of work in, into this particular act. So have an appreciation and uh, just listen to the show. That's no, yeah, that's well, no, that's a big thing uh, in terms of, you know, it's the let's see you do it mentality. It's like, oh, you think I'm so bad? Let's see you do it, you know? And that's something I've always gone by. The, the thing I just remembered mm -hmm. um, that I messed up last time is that th the reason why I, I made the differentiation between something like a garbage man and an entertainer is there is such a low success rate for entertainment. And so I, I'd say the big thing that people got to understand when when like, it, you know, an entertainer tweets about something as like, oh, wow, that's weird, that's different. You know, oh, well, well, you're not considering numbers and statistics and all this stuff. And it's like, you gotta think, there was less than a 1% chance that I would do this. Mm -hmm. So if you're that person who managed to beat those odds, other statistics don't, like they mean less to you. You know what I mean? And so if, if it, you know, it's like, oh, well, oh, there's only a 20% chance that a lot of people are telling me uh, with the game I'm producing now, oh, there's only a 20% chance that this will take off less than a 5% chance. And I'm like, there was less than a 1% chance that, that, you know, 50,000, 60,000 people would, would, would look at what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you think about, you think about Kanye West where it's like, you know, 10 different record labels turned him down. Then the first album he gets, it's a huge hit. And he's like a big star now. And like, you know, Oh, four Oh five. And so you got to think like, like I don't, when Kanye West goes off on, on some things, some wild tangent, I don't, I don't blame him. Like, dude, like everybody told this guy, like, or, or when he has the bravado or the ego or whatever, everybody told this guy, he wouldn't be anything. And it, you know, I, I can understand how somebody has this sort of, you know, borderline God complex. Cause it's like, you know, people told you for so long, it would be nothing. And then you show up, you prove everybody wrong. And so now it's like, kind of, you go through life, like, you know, fuck everybody, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like Russell it, it's Westbrook. It's one of those things. That... Did you yeah. see that the other no, day? It, Russell Westbrook when, uh, what is it? Adam A. Smith. Steve, Stephen A. Smith. Yeah, Stephen A. Smith. Uh, commented on him and he said, 
I'm not in it for the championships. Do you know my life? You have no idea. That's why I stay quiet about them and just stay in my lane and do my job because I know what I'm doing. No, absolutely. Um, I, I think part of it got lost in translation a little bit between Stephen A. and Russell Westbrook because it's, uh, you know, he was strictly talking basketball. I, I feel like Stephen A. agrees with everything Westbrook said from the standpoint mm -hmm. of like, you know, these guys do need to be appreciated that they were able to come. Some of them came from very rough neighborhoods and they were able to, you know, generate this multi-generational uh, wealth. And so, uh, so yeah, that, that absolutely has to be acknowledged. I think about it more in terms of, you know, not just athletes, but I think about it in terms of pop stars. I think about it in terms of like, you know, you, 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 you're, you're taking, you know, 17 year old girls and now they are the main breadwinner of their family and they do 20 million in one year and, and, and all this stuff. And, and so appreciating that in any facet, not just what you're into, you know what I mean? Like I appreciate it. If a game developer does that, I appreciate it. If a singer does that, I appreciate it. It, you know, for anything, as long as you're not scamming people or doing anything mm -hmm. like that, you know, I appreciate it on all facets. If you were able to, to be the guy to break the hump, you know, first generate first generation, I want to make that very clear. Uh, if you were a first generation person yeah. and you were able to do that. Yeah. I have a couple more questions for you, Max. And this one in terms yeah. of adversity, you mentioned that you had a pretty good growing up, but you, you suffered from sleep insomnia is there any adversity that you have faced that you use to encourage you in your work? It might hinder you at times, but it motivates you as well. And how would you motivate other people in the adversity that they face? Uh, you can't, uh, you, you can't use things like you can't find uh, excuses, I guess, like, or, or if something bad happens to you, you, you can't use it as an excuse. You got to use it as some form of a fuel, I guess, or criticism, you know, and, and that's a big thing with sports too. Like using, you know, one time I saw a guy, uh, I, I don't know, they were like, they said, oh, well, you should never pursue success out of spite. That's just wrong. And I'm like, literally, Shaquille O'Neal, Russell Westbrook, all these guys have always said that. They've always said, oh, I'm going to remember this guy's name, that guy's name. Okay, let's prove all these people wrong. And that, that was sort of like me, you know, like I, I can't tell you how many people personally said to my face, this is going to be nothing. You know, I had an aunt, well, she's divorced now. She's not in the family anymore. She's not my aunt, fuck her. Uh, but I remember we were in the car. She, she was a she was a, a professor at, at like universities and all that. I don't know. She did some major that nobody cares about. And so she stops me in the car and she's like, Oh, hey, uh, Max, I got a great idea, uh, you know, because she knew I was trying to do the video thing. And it was, you know, it was, I don't know, it was maybe a couple months into my YouTube tear. And she's like, I have a great idea. What if you got a computer science degree and you do the video thing for fun? And I looked at her. I said, I don't want to be a computer scientist. I'm not some nerd. Screw that. <laughs> you know, like it was, you know. Not, not to say, no, I, I think computer science is important, mm -hmm. uh, programming and all that. I think that's very important, but you know, it just wasn't for me. That, that's the point. And so, you know, and, and so it, it's stuff like that. Uh, the, the writing bell, the wall, oh, they tell me, oh, well, uh, well, my family member, oh my God, it, it was so many things. They would talk to some random producer. This is the other thing. College's meaning has entirely evaporated from what it was in 1981. Um, and so it's, uh, it's this thing where, oh, well, uh, I was talking to this, this producer and this is going to go back into the adversity thing you said. Uh, but they'll be like, oh, I was talking to this uh, producer who produced nothing you've ever heard of. And, uh, Hey, um, she said that the four-year experience for a filmmaker is very important in college and, and da, 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 uh, because it gives you, it makes you well-rounded. It gives you life experience and, and all this stuff. And it's like, dude, I saw like, I, I can't tell you how much life experience you have just like just watching a homeless guy smoke crack that dude that is like a world of what the hell is going on you know you know on, you know a, a couple months ago I was on a, I was on the New York City subway and I, there was a homeless woman just pissing on the train dude that is more experience than any college will ever give you for real like like that that, that is it and so you know the well-rounded thing like I get it I get why they say it okay, you got to experience a lot of arts, you got to develop yourself. And they think that college is going to curate that for you. That's what she meant by that. And that's what I know now. But I was able to curate that for myself. Maybe other people aren't. And so the thing with adversity, especially with comedy, because we were talking about comedy earlier, is that all the weird shit that happens to you, 
you know, that's that's where a lot of your jokes are going to come from. Your brain has to be broken to be funny. You have to be you have to be so like mashed in the head with awful experiences and wild things. Dude, the police showed up to my house at least 10 times when I was growing up over some domestic dispute. I, I saw so much crazy shit, you know, and so it was a I remember one time I was 12 years old down the street, the cul-de-sac playing with a friend and um his cousin shows up. He's like, oh yeah, my cousin's in a MS-13. It's this guy like covered in tattoos. And you know, like I'm like 12 years old, I'm like this doughy 12 year old kid. I'm like, oh, I hope I don't do too well. He might get mad at me and shoot me, you know, like, like all this stuff, you know? And um, it was uh, like, I saw a lot of stuff growing up and a lot of people who try to pursue the arts who came from, you know, middle class to upper middle class neighborhood, they didn't see any wild stuff. And, and, you know, to, to your point with adversity, adversity, uh, seeing that wild stuff, let's say that's the adversity, uh, that's what really fuels you. You know, mm -hmm. that's what's going to, you know, make your creative juices work. Um, and so, you know, but that's, that's just kind of, don't use them as that's excuses. That's what I've seen. Yeah. Like, like, I don't, yeah, don't use it as excuses, you know, use it, use it as fuel. It, the reality is like, I can't think of a single funny comedian who didn't have a, a, an insane, weird, you know, effed up childhood. I, I, I can't think of one because I look at all these guys' stories. It was something strange. It was something where they're experiencing the world different from other people, you know, you know, all this stuff, you know, like I had a, one time I put a poll on Twitter that was uh, when you were a kid, uh, did child protective services show up to your house more than twice? 90% of people said no. I was like, damn, that happened like four times for me. What the hell? You know, so it's, it's, it's all this stuff, but you know, it, we're in this, we're, we're definitely in this Twitter, Instagram, self-psychology era where we tell, we tell ourselves, oh, if bad things happen to your childhood, you're helpless. Oh, you're helpless. You can't do that. And it's like, dude, that's so soft, especially, you know, not to get too racial, but like, you know, like, like, I, you know, I talk to, you know, I'll say like it is, I talk to a lot of white kids from really nice neighborhoods. And these are the saddest people I know. These are the saddest, most un- uh, ambitious people that I meet, you know, kids, I don't know how older generations are, mm -hmm. but like these Gen Zers and they're like, oh, well, well, I read, a, I read a post on Instagram that said, because this happened to me, uh, I have, I have BPD and depression and blah, blah, blah. And so I can't, blah, blah, blah. you know, it, it's like, we, we we're in this era for Gen Zers of like self-diagnosing your problems and, and finding confirmation bias for why you're a quitter. And, and that's what I, that's what I hate. That's what I absolutely hate. And it, it's, you know, and that's what I see. Like I have a diverse audience and, and that's what you see. Like when I, um, you know, when I go on a stream and I say, I'm trying to be a millionaire, you know, the white kids are like, Oh, that's weird. He's arrogant. He's this and that the, the, the black and Mexican kids are like, yeah, me too. You know? <laughs> and so it's, yeah. you start with less, you pursue more, yeah. start with less, pursue more. So, um, but yeah, that, that, that's sort of how I've seen it broken down. Well, it's funny because I think a lot of people would say that they're seeing that sort of occurrence with younger people. But hearing you at 26, I think there's a, a there is a glimmer of hope for our future, knowing that not all kids are thinking like that. Not that you're a kid at 26, but being young enough to realize and having your hand not too far away from your teens and almost into your 30s, knowing you have a really good perspective on life is what I believe. Thank you. Therapists would disagree, but <laughs> you know that's how he, he likes. That's you. another thing is that therapists. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, no. Well, no. See, it's interesting because uh, a couple of years ago, I was getting really into psychology, and I was trying to talk to not therapists, psychologists, mm -hmm. and I was trying to talk to them. You know, people that I knew through university connections, and I would try to talk to them about motivating other people because that's huge. You think about Michael Jordan. The thing they said is he made everyone around them better. So what I was trying to learn is, you know, it might seem a tad manipulative, but I was trying to see how do I manage talent? How do I get people to do the right thing for them and do the right thing for the greater good of the group, you know, and, uh, and, and you look into a lot of that, but on, and so I would say some theories, sometimes they confirm them, sometimes they deny them. Like I talk to, you know, professors to verify, like, I don't talk out of my ass. Like I, I go to people and talk and ask before I say things publicly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, one time I made the mistake before I got the, the psychologist connection, I just talked to a therapist and I was like, Hey, I'll give you 50 bucks. I'll give you 50 bucks. Just don't talk to me like a patient. 
Just, I'm, I have these questions about how the human mind works. Talk to me immediately. They're in their playbook. Oh, how does that make you feel? I'm like, I'm asking you, like, what, you, you know, like, like it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's that whole thing where it's like, it's like, dude, just like, don't talk. Like, and I knew what she was doing, you know, but uh, one, one thing a guy said to me was, remember, therapists aren't doctors. Therapists are not scientists. So that was a big thing. But no, but no, this lady, uh, yeah, she was trying to say, oh, oh, there's this, this, and this wrong with you. Uh, you know, um, there was a, we had a big disagreement on what makes a human being matter. And, and she's like, oh, so, so you work so hard. Why? I'm like, I work hard because that's what you have to do. Like you, you have to work. We've been working since the beginning of time. And, and, and I, like I say to her, I'm like some, some guy who, you know, just like lives off his parents' money, you know, sits in a bed all day, playing video games, consuming, 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 not doing anything, not impacting anyone else's life. Like, I'm sorry, explain to me how he matters. Explain to me, you know? And, and so, cause it's like, I'm busting my ass here trying to do this. You're trying to tell me that this guy's on the same level as me, like, sorry. Like, and that's where the competitive sort of, you know, thing comes out. And a lot of people consider that screwed up, but I'm just like, like, dude, like I'm busting my ass and you're going to tell me, oh yeah, he's just as good as you. No, sorry. Like that's not how it works to me anyway. Um, and so, yeah. I think as a, you will make a good director because that's what like a manager, right? Is it, am I wrong? And kind of understanding what a director does, would that be similar to a business manager of sorts? So a manager, okay, so, so and I tried management. I, I, I attempted management, but it was hard to find people because at the end of the day, when you're a manager, you work for them. Mm -hmm. When you're a director, they work for you. That's kind of the core uh, difference there. And so, you know, when you're a director, they're only there for a project. For a manager, you're there for their whole career. And so I, you know, I could have all the great advice and all that, but no, at the end of the day, you know, there are similar skills. Absolutely. You, you, you'd be right. Um, but sort of um, with the management thing. And again, that's, that's why I said the suburban kids, you know, you'd find, you know, you'd find a girl who gets likes and she's inconsistent and all this stuff. And I'm like, dude, I could, I, I could get you to quit your day job in 18 months. If you listen to everything I say, and you could, you could be a model or an actor or whatever. I know that you have everything that you need. Just, just give me 18 months, but they never do it because mm. they have a safety net. They have their parents. They have, you know, they have, uh, you know, boyfriends letting them live rent free. They have, you know, you know, all this stuff. And so sometimes, uh, sometimes that'll get in the way. Uh, a director is kind of, uh, being a director, it's more intense in the moment, but once you're done, you're done with a manager. It's less intense in the moment, but it's just a consistent sort of grind. Mm. Um, that's sort of how I've seen it. And, and when it comes to a manager, you have to convince, you know, you have to convince what's in their best interest for a director. You're just trying to get the shot done. You know, you're just trying to get the project done. So it's, I, I don't I, I could talk about it more in detail if you like it. Well, it's what I like about what you're saying that you do is you're trying to help people be the best that they can be. And so that they, and it's not, you don't feel threatened by that you don't feel like they're trying to take over your position you're trying to help them strive where they are uh it's because i know they will take over my position um it, it it's it's sort of you know like so, some people would say oh that's very very arrogant all this stuff but it it's just look I, i've met i've met thousands of people all trying to you know do this do that whatever and it gets to a point where okay i am different okay, there is something that sets me apart. And, and, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people are really scared to verbalize it to themselves because they're afraid of the criticism that mm. comes with that. I, I, I don't really care. Um, because, you know, if I know that I'm busting my ass, that's all that matters. If I know that I'm working as hard as I possibly could, that's all that matters. And so, uh, you know, it becomes a thing where, and again, like I'm not, it's, it's really hard to find multi-talented people. Like when I'm hiring people, like I don't know how to program. It's really hard to find a programmer who's who just, you know, it has problem solving ability and will consistently show up. That's really hard to find. It's really hard to find an artist who can do a certain art style and can show up for a decent amount of money and, and bang out a hundred drawings, you know, like stuff like this. Like, and so, and so what I, 
you know, I do, I do sound design. I do, I do writing. I do, you know, all this stuff that, you know, sort of gives me a footing where if I'm doing enough jobs, I can just pretty much say, okay, I'm the director too. Uh, I just don't meet people that can do multiple things. And it's, it's like a thing where, and you know, the, the big thing is, oh, well, why are some people more successful than you? Cause they have connections. And so, so would you it's say one of those things? Would you say yes. that those people don't exist or those people exist, but they're not willing to put in that work at all? They, they have those raw talents. They have those skills. They can program. They can draw, but they're not willing to sit down. I was watching a drawing video yesterday with my son, and, and the guy's just like, just draw. Keep drawing. Keep doodling. Keep doing. You got to keep doing it. And these people are just not willing to put that work. And you, what I appreciate about you, about you is the work ethic that you have. I think that's the, the core of what, what drives you is your willingness to work. And not all people have that. Most people don't have the level. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Some people do it for survival. Some people will work to survive, but they don't have that level to succeed and to excel. A lot of people don't have, I guess, sort of like entrepreneurial mindsets, I guess, where where a lot of people don't like that it's all on them. It's all on their shoulders. People, you know, people really shy away from that. And, um, you know, it, it's people are too afraid of criticism in the moment, especially if they have friends who, with big followings where they're making good stuff, you know, they don't want to try. To, to your question on do those people not exist, I mean, I've, those people exist – those, the, I get, like I said, th those people are are Howard Stern. Those people mm. are Kanye West. Those people are are Jamie Foxx. Those people are, um, you know, Penn and Teller. Like that's who those people are. We we see these people all the time. Um, and and are there other people who are multi talented, really good that haven't been discovered yet? Yes, absolutely. I'm just not running into them. Mm. I'm not saying that I know the world. But in my network of people, I haven't ran into that yet. Um, you know, to say that that I am I am the greatest talent ever. You know, like again, I I think there are plenty of people who are more talent. We're not getting another Michael Jackson for another 150 years. I guarantee you, I am not the next Michael Jackson. You know, you know, and again, he was multi talented, but like you take out dancing and maybe mm -hmm. it's it's sound design or something like that. You know, and so. It's uh, I wasn't insanely talented. Like I, I, the only thing that I showed any talent for was I, you know, I could be funny. I could keep a room going for like 30 minutes and I, you know, I could sort of like, I knew how to, you know, edit and, you know, direct a scene. Those are the only two skills that I had going for me. When I, when I came out of high school, I had no idea about audio. I had no idea about direction. I had no, I didn't really have a big idea on acting. Um, I didn't know anything about lighting. I didn't know about uh, cinematography or lenses or how how lenses work or aperture or shutter speed. I didn't I didn't know any of this. Like you could you could name something that you saw, and I, I'd tell you when I started picking that up. Um, you know, it's the majority of what I do, what people follow me for, was not stuff that I knew out of the gate. So mm. you know, in terms of in terms of latent talent and what brought that out. The work brought that out. Grind. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm against. Yeah, the grind, absolutely. And so it, it's, it's repetition. The, the biggest key to success is the ability and desire to practice. And so, oh God, you know, like I, I had a, I, I, I did some stat. I was counting through my videos of, of sound design and putting effects and mixing and stuff like that. And it took me 103 shorts to finally have a level of sound design that one would consider like professional, like Hollywood standard professional. And so, you know, I don't, dude, like I don't meet a lot of people who make 103 shorts with variety. I, I, I can't, I can't meet those people, you know, some, not to say that there's other people again, like, like I'm not, I'm not the richest guy I know. I'm not the guy making all the money I know. Like there's people with more followers than me, of course. Um, but it, it's sort of, I don't know, like, like I, I just really have the desire. Um, but you know, sometimes we're also seeing generationally, like people don't like the guy who works really hard. A lot of people find that intimidating and they don't want to hire that guy. Oh, I, I I'm sure I've missed out on, you know, jobs here and there where, where people were, were too afraid of, of working with a guy who's like, I, I'll take over, you know, I have no problem doing that. And so a lot of people feel 
you know, I, I guess a lot of people feel challenged in that sense, or they feel awkward and all this stuff. And that's just not the Hollywood that I witnessed growing up where, where you're afraid to, so that's another big thing. People are so afraid to work with strangers. People are so, people feel like they have to be friends to work with people. What is that? You know, it's so, so many times, like, like I, I, I hit up so many people. I, I, I didn't know at all. I hit up a, a guy who produced for Missy Elliott, you know, a, a couple of years ago and uh, to, to score a piece of my game. And I worked with him and I didn't know him at all, but now I do. And, you know, is it awkward to work with people the first time when you don't know them? Yeah, sure. But, it, it, you know, that's what separates, uh, that's what separates the men from the boys, let's say. Have you um, not tried LinkedIn? Are you on LinkedIn? No. For because a reason? It's, it's not really. It's, it's not a bad place. It's, it's really a good a... place to make connect. I'll tell you, you could easily, as, as, as you, Max Field, making connection as a cinnamon photographer director it's a place you'll see some i mean it doesn't take any effort right you just put your your thing up there and check it out and make connections because i've met some pretty interesting people that way and connections do come that way it's it's a free resource and you don't have to pay for it right you can get the premium package and stuff but it, it it's a way it's another way Right. I mean, I, I haven't run into a situation usually like when a client wants me, like I got zoom because of a client like three years ago, usually when a client tells me, Oh, Hey, get this. That's how I usually get into something. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the same with Facebook. It was the same with, with a lot of stuff. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure I'm not counting it out, but it's just, you know, I've tried a multitude of platforms for work and it's just the YouTube stuff is what brings in yep. all the traffic. It's what yep. brings in all the people to me. And so, so it's like when you have one thing that works, you know, you're, oh, you're less cool. interested in trying the things that might work. I like what you, you know, said. It, it's, it's which is go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. The, what you said, and I think it's universal for any job and you tried 103 times right before you made something that you thought was professional. And if you take that for any sort of job, if you're willing to do something a hundred times before you're going to get it right, you know, throwing out a resume a hundred times, most people won't do that. I know people that throw out one or two and think, oh, this is the end of it. And I get rejected. I'm done. Try out a hundred. I mean, try a thousand. I'd like to even know how many videos you've made. And because all of these are steps towards you accomplishing your goal. Right. So they're all, they're all uh, dude, I've, steps. <laughs> How many? I've written probably 500 scripts, right? 500 Five. scripts probably. Um, you know, and, and that was another thing. Like, like I, I, it's annoying when people think they're working hard, but they're not, that pisses me off so much when I'm like, I'm like, Oh, Oh yeah. He, he's a, he's a good writer. He writes a lot. How do, how do, how many scripts is he right here? Three, three. You gotta be kidding me. I write three in a week. Like, like <laughs> you know and so uh yeah. you but but that's the thing like you you get annoyed when people give you similar when people give someone else again it's a competitive thing it's it's a sports yeah. raised thing yeah. you get you get annoyed when when people who you know are not putting in even a quarter of the work are getting equal or higher recognition that that you know that's what i don't like like if there's somebody working just as hard and getting more recognition okay, that's, that's connections. That's the luck of the draw. That's fine. But when it's, I mean, it's still connections, if, you know, for the other thing, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's one of those things in terms of, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, making shorts and, and here's another thing about, so let's say that number is a hundred, right. Uh, of sound design mix, whatever's. So that number is a hundred after 20 in the moment, I think this is professional. And that gets into that self-empathy. You always have to think that you are doing your best shit. Always. Yeah. You always have to believe that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, you know, and so, but, but again, with the knowledge I know now, I look back and, uh, but yeah, at, at about a hundred, which was, uh, and I hit a hundred, maybe, maybe like three years ago now, that's when I started noticing, okay, like, like this is, I found my standards. I found what I do. I have compared it with Hollywood features. This is, this is, this is where I sit. And that's another thing. Like people, people, I was always holding myself to the standard of Hollywood movies that I grew up watching. Mm -hmm. That's what I held myself to the standard of. And a lot of people would hold themselves to, Oh, I just want to be okay. 
you know, or, or, or uh, what's it called? Aim for the stars, land on the clouds, that sort of saying. I guess that's the kind of philosophy, but, you know, it is what it is. Max, how can people reach you? How can they get in touch with you? Besides LinkedIn, obviously. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, SBN3 on Twitter. SBN3 on Twitter. SBN3 on YouTube. Where did that come on from? Instagram. What? SBN3. Uh, it was... I had a channel called, uh, there was a Pete Rock song called Soul Brother Number One. And so I got banned twice for copyright stuff. So it ended up being Soul Brother Number Three. And I was like, well, that's a mouthful. So it became SBN3. Uh, and, and, and now people can actually find me through Google. Uh, that, mm -hmm. was, that wasn't happening four years ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, no, so, so four, four characters is a lot easier to remember than, uh, than 15. Uh, but, but yeah. One final question, Max. Yep. Why do you work? To get rich. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't doubt that you will be. I mean, you have the work ethic. You're young and you have, you have whatever it seems to take to do what is necessary to, to achieve those dreams and, and those goals, however you want to put it. But with the work that you put in to just to watch your videos, to know, you know, a little bit behind the scenes of what you're actually putting in, there's no doubt that you can do that. Max Field, SBN3, director, cinematographer, YouTuber, soon to be director of a feature film near you. I appreciate your time and I appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. Hopefully uh, an agent sees the same way. Thank you to Max Field for coming on, also known as SBN3. Find him. You can find him on YouTube in particular, and as he mentioned, some other places on Twitter and Instagram. Find me on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube here. You can click the notification, subscribe, share, and uh, you can find my podcast on Apple uh, Spotify, Google, any of those, Stitcher. If you would like to be a guest or you know someone who would make a good guest, email me at whyweworkbrianv at gmail.com. Whyweworkbrianvee -E at gmail.com. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. <laughs>